Hello, welcome to VMC. I'm Dr. M. In today's video, we're tackling the often overlooked topic of anal glands. Join me to learn how these small glands can cause big problems. You'll learn something today. So you might be wondering, what are anal glands? Well, they are small glands that are located at about the four o'clock and eight o'clock position, just inside the rectum, if you imagine the rectum as a clock. They fill up with a sebaceous secretion that is quite similar to the oil that your hair follicles secrete. When they are functioning normally, they will express every single time your animal has a bowel movement, but they don't always function as they should. If the anal glands are not functioning properly, the common symptoms that we will see are things like the animal dragging their butt on the ground or on grass, on rugs. Your pet might be licking at their rectum. Some people will even see swollen or red appearance around the rectum. There can be a strong odor. If the anal gland ruptures, then you can see purulent material draining from beside the rectum. Next, let's cover the common causes for anal gland issues. Probably the most common reason that I see in practice are when there's something going on with the GI tract. The animal might be having constipation or diarrhea or flipping back and forth between the two. They might have some sort of GI disease and dysbiosis. These GI issues will cause anal gland problems because when the animal is defecating, the proper pressure is not being put on the anal glands so they aren't emptying as they should. We can also see anal gland problems because of chronic skin or allergy issues. Inflammation that impacts the skin or the GI tract will also result in inflammation in the anal glands. If the animal is obese, especially if they have extra fat around their tail base, that can impact the ability of the anal gland to function. Another incredibly common cause for anal gland symptoms that I see in patients is improper, poorly formulated, non-research-based diets being fed to those animals. This is because those poorly formulated diets do not have the proper balance of soluble to insoluble fibers. They may not have all the prebiotics that the gut needs to stay as healthy as we want it to be. And so as a result, the stool quality is impacted, inflammation in the GI tract is occurring, and the animal has chronic anal gland issues. Lastly, and probably least common in my experience, there are some animals that have an anatomical malformation of some sort. Those things also can cause recurring anal gland symptoms in patients. As I'm sure you can imagine, how we approach anal gland issues and the specific treatment that we implement depends on what potential potential underlying causes we're dealing with. For patients that I see with this problem, I will check for a secondary infection in the anal glands. If we find a secondary infection that does need to be treated, that can be a little tricky to do, but a lot of patients do not have an infection present. In that scenario, what we do is we discuss their diet history. If they are not eating a properly formulated diet that meets WSABA guidelines, then we discuss moving over to an over-the-counter option that does. However, I will commonly also discuss moving to a prescription gastro diet that has more fiber in it. Most commercial diets do not have enough fiber to try to help manage an anal gland issue, but there are a number of prescription diets that do. Some patients can eat this prescription gastro diet just for the short term in order to kind of get things under control and then move to an over-the-counter that is formulated to help support the GI tract. That said, there are some pets that end up needing the prescription gastro diets for the rest of their lives, and that's also just fine. An additional benefit of all of those prescription diets is that other than the WD, they do all have additional omega fatty acids in them. When we have patients that are dealing with allergies, omega fatty acids are often part of our treatment plan to reduce inflammation in the skin and in the anal glands, and so having that already built into the diet is very helpful. That said, there are going to be some patients where a prescription gastro diet does not resolve their problems. In that case, I start discussing a proper prescription hypoallergenic food trial in 
order to check for a food allergy. These animals may not have any other symptoms. However, we know that there is a small percentage of patients that their only symptom of a food allergy will be recurring anal gland problems. Now I hear you saying, what about all these supplements that are advertised to me all the time? Unfortunately, none of them have the best research demonstrating that they actually do what they claim. A lot of these supplements will have some fiber in them, maybe they'll have some probiotics in them. The challenge is that on their own, these supplements do not make up for a poorly formulated diet. They also don't give us the proper balance of soluble to insoluble fibers. So I don't ever bother to use these supplements on their own. If I have a dog or a cat that say is 95% managed on their prescription gastro diet, then I might add in a supplement to see if that can help just improve things just a little bit more. Although they sound great in theory, there just isn't enough research to prove that they're successful and I also find in clinical practice they're generally not. This does make sense because it's very challenging in a supplement to get therapeutic amounts of fiber in there and it also doesn't account for that very necessary balance of soluble to insoluble fiber in order to get the correct stool size and consistency that we need to promote anal gland expression. In my clinical experience the the vast, vast majority of the patients I see with anal gland problems will be addressed by maintaining a lean body condition score, feeding an appropriate diet, whether that's uh, over-the-counter prescription gastro or prescription hypoallergenic formula, it's going to depend from patient to patient. And sometimes we also end up needing to treat underlying pain that might be affecting how they posture to defecate and those sorts of things. But in the vast majority of cases, when we address those problems, then the anal gland issues resolve as well. There are going to be rare situations where they don't. Say there's a stenotic anal gland duct or another problem like that. In those cases, I will absolutely refer patients to see a veterinary soft tissue surgeon. It's possible to remove the anal glands surgically. I do really caution people about this as it's invasive. The recovery isn't always the easiest and there is a risk of fecal incontinence. So before we go to something that invasive, it's very important that all of the things I've talked about in this video are done. However, if all of those things have failed, then absolutely we should be talking with a surgeon about anal gland removal. I hope that you found all of this information helpful. If you have a topic you'd like me to cover in the future, please comment it down below. I love to hear from you and I do read every comment you leave for me to prove it. I highlight a new comment every week. I also do put up a new video most Fridays and I cannot wait to see you in the next one. You take care of yourself. <laughs> Bye! As a special treat this week, I have a bonus fact for you. Did you know that humans also have anal glands? Oh, I don't know why this fact disturbs me so much, but it really does, and I am not responsible for any nightmares that it gives you. <laughs> See you next week!